Uh, this next song that I'd like to perform for you is, uh, you know, what, one of the one of the cool things about um, playing the ukulele is that you know you have um, you have a very limited range, and you and you you have just basically four strings to work with. And I kind of talked about this the last time I was here. I, I I said that you only have four strings, and sometimes you know it can appear to be very limiting, right? Because you think, oh. On the ukulele, I only have four strings, but like on the guitar, you know, guitar has six strings and you can get a much fuller sound and a bigger sound and you always want more and more and more and more, right? So I, I, um, I wrote this song uh, recently because I've been trying to compose more and I always try to come up with like a concept or an idea, you know, whenever I'm writing a new piece. So this idea though came about by accident. See, I was changing my ukulele strings one day and I put the first string on and then I put the second string on and then I was gonna put the third string on, but I couldn't find that string. So I was like, oh, where did I put my third string? So, so I grabbed the fourth string, I put the fourth string on. And instead of rushing off to look for another third string, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool to write a song with just three strings? So this is a, this is a song called Missing Three. And, um, and, it, and it's a piece, it just, uses three strings that's that's it and i and i thought it was it was kind of cool because on the ukulele you always want more you always think you need more strings you need a greater range so this is a, a song called missing three that kind of proves that you don't always need more you know sometimes less truly is more and if you and if you know what you're going for if you know what you want to say or what you're trying to communicate you know then sometimes you know you can just do it with three strings rather than four so here is a here's a song called missing three
Thank you. Song and Tab Missing Three. A um, couple other things happened uh, to me while uh, since the last time I was here. Um, uh, shortly after I, I, I was here at Google, I, um, I got married. So that was pretty cool. And, um, and seven weeks ago, my wife and I had our first baby. I know, I'm a, I'm a dad. That's kind of a scary thought, right? <laughs> but it's, it's the most amazing thing, you know, like I, because I, I'm kind of at that age where, you know, uh, a lot of my, my friends, you know, have, have children and a lot of them are, you know, they, they, they're on their second child already. But I remember when they first had their baby, you know, they would always send me photos or they would, um, you know, like on, on their, on their phones, they'd show me pictures and, you know, on the, and then I'm just like, oh yeah, cute. But on the inside, I'm like, I don't want to see this. Why are you showing me this, right? <laughs> but it's it's amazing. Like it's so different when it's your own child, you know. When it's your own child, you're just like, oh my god. Every little thing that that they do, it's like the most, cu it's the cutest, most adorable thing. And and it's so funny because like you know now like I'll send pictures to everyone and I just, but it's uh, but it's it's really the most amazing thing. And uh, and so this this. Next song was, uh, I, I wrote it actually, um, maybe when my wife was about six months pregnant, you know, I, I wrote this song for, uh, for the baby and, um, and it's a song I call Gentle Mandolin. And you know, like how I was explaining before uh, that when I, when, I write a, when I write a piece, I always like to have some concept, you know, something that is different from anything else that I've, that I've done before in the past. And, and the way this song came about was it was, uh, I, I love the sound of the mandolin. You know, the mandolin is actually tuned like a, like a violin. So it has a very, um, it has a wide range. It has over a three octave range, whereas the ukulele only has a two octave range. So you can get these beautiful lush chords on the, on the mandolin that, that are very difficult to get on the ukulele. So I came across this chord voicing that, you know, that, that to me, in, in, in my mind, you know, kind of mimics the voicing of a mandolin player. And it sounds like this. It's a, it's a really far stretch like this, but, but you get this kind of sound. You know? It doesn't sound like an ukulele. It sounds more like a mandolin. So I wrote this song, and I, I used that, that idea for this tune for my son, and I call it Gentle Mandolin. And the title came about because I was thinking that I hope one day when my son grows up, he'll be a, he'll grow up to be a fine, gentle mandolin, you know. So, here we go. It's cheesy, I know. All right, here we go.
Um, you know, I, I get my inspiration from uh, from a, a lot of things. I mean, I'm sure like it's the same for all of you. I mean, all of you here, you're you're all artists, and you're always like, you know, trying to think of the the, the next thing and the you know what's going to be that 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 next uh, big idea. And, and it's funny because sometimes you know, like I'll get my I get a lot of my inspiration from like the most unusual thing, the the most unusual things. Um, I, I just did that. Uh, uh, I, I did a short interview out here for your that that video. Uh, I think it's called uh, my my favorite things. Is it called yeah. my favorite my favorite things? And uh, so one of the things that I talked about was was uh, one of my favorite performances ever was a performance of Bill Cosby. You know, Bill Cosby a long time ago he did this uh, HBO special, this stand up comedy special called Bill Cosby himself. And it was the most, I think, till this day, of like all the comedians out there, this performance is still like the, the, the Bible of stand-up comedy, you know. And if you haven't seen it, you really should check it out. Uh, you guys have it in your archives, so you should definitely <laughs> check it out. Um, but if you can get the actual DVD of the entire performance, it's it is truly amazing. It's it's almost two hours long, and Bill Cosby sits in a chair, not even a, a high chair, like a regular, like a chair that you're sitting in. He's just sitting in that chair, holding a microphone, and telling these stories. And you got just, I mean, everyone's just at the the edge of their seats, just dying, laughing, so entertained. And I realized because, see, for me that was very significant because. When I first started out playing the ukulele, I was always um, I was always playing with a singer. There was always a singer, and then I would be in the back playing. You know, you know, I would always be I would be the I would be the backing guy. You know, so I'd be in the back, just kind of playing, and then and then when when they're done singing, then I take a little solo. You know, and then back to you know, and then they're singing again. So. So that was kind of my job because, and the reason for that is because I am a terrible singer. I can't sing to save my life. So, so after after a while, you know, I um, when I stopped working with singers, I thought um, when when my I, I I had this little band in high school, and when we and when we broke up, I thought, oh no, that's the end for me because you know what am I gonna do? I can't sing. You know, I'm just gonna play my ukulele. And I remember being so intimidated by standing up in front of an audience just with my ukulele and playing. In fact, some of my early performances, I would like go on stage and just be like, uh, oh, this song is uh, called Sunshine of Your Love. <laughs> you know, and I would start playing, but I, I just, I was so afraid, you know, because I just thought oh, the ukulele by itself sounds so, you know, it just sounds so empty and it doesn't have that full sound that I'm used to hearing when I go and listen to a concert. I want that big, big sound, right? But I couldn't get that with this instrument. But when I saw Bill Cosby himself, when I saw him and I, I just, I saw a man just come up on stage in front of, you know, thousands of people, sit in a chair with a microphone and he was just he could just connect with every single person in the room. And I, and I was watching this on television, and I still felt like I was there. I felt like he, every story he was, he was telling, he was like looking right at me and telling this, like I was sitting down in his living room and he was just sharing this amazing story with me. You know, and I was so inspired by that because then I realized, you know what, the instrument that we hold is just an illusion. You know, guitar players, like if you watch Jimi Hendrix, yeah, he's playing the guitar, but the guitar is just an illusion. You know, his artistry, his music, he's communicating. I mean, he's, he's just, it's his whole, before, before you even hear his guitar, you're hearing his spirit. You know, it's, it's like, uh, it's, he's just, he's communicating this, this thing, you know, the, like, I, like, like one of the things that I believe is all the music that you play and you hear happens, it's created and happens before it even hit, gets to your instrument. You know, before I play that chord, I need to create it inside of me, you know, like I need to feel it and just like create it first and then, then I can play that chord, you know, or, or before I, I, I bend that note, you know. You 
you know? I need to like create it inside of me before it even gets to the instrument. So that's why I used to watch him and I, I used to watch him all the time. I watched that, that performance over and over and just, you know, he's just so natural. And it's and it's uh, the 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 title of that of that tour was Bill Cosby himself, and I realized that that's all that's all you got to be is you just you know it doesn't matter if you're talking to one person or or a thousand people, you know you just the more you the more you're comfortable with who you are if you can just get up in front and just not be afraid to make fun of yourself or you know and not not to have expectations of the audience I think is a big key. And that's the cool thing about being an ukulele player is that audiences have such low expectations <laughs> of me anyway, right? So if I don't have any expectations of my audience, I can simply get up on stage and just do my thing and I don't have to worry about anything. If someone laughs, if they stay, then that's all a bonus, you know? So, so I'd like to, um, uh, what, what, I, I, was, I was telling that story because I was gonna go in, I was trying to relate that to a song. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, um, what song was I going to play now? I, I don't remember, but, but anyways, any, anyways, so that's, that's kind of, um, that, that's kind of where, where a lot of my inspiration came from, you know, it's, it's, it's not so much like about playing the ukulele, but it's, it's just, it's just about communicating with people. You know, and, and, and that's that's what all of you do, you know, I mean, through Google, through YouTube, you know, you're providing a, a vehicle, you know, for people to communicate from one side of our planet all the way to the other side. And it makes the planet seem so much smaller, makes our world seem so much smaller. And, you know, and I think that's a great thing, you know, because, because I, I grew up in Hawaii, you know, where we're very... We live on a small island and, and everyone's so community minded, you know, we're always thinking about the other person and we all see how we're related and what I do affects this other person, you know, what, what that person does affects, affects the other person. And I think, I think it's, it's such a great way, you know, to look at the world now is that, you know, we are all connected. We're all connected. And, um, and I, I think uh, through music and through, through what, what you do, I think it's the perfect example because to me music is not just a universal language, but it's the language of the universe, you know, and you're helping to spread that language all across the, the, the world, and it's, and it's a beautiful thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play uh, one more song here, and, and this is, uh, and they, they asked me to, to not, you know, to, to try to play more original stuff just because of, um, I know, copyright issues and all of that, but, you know, but I, I, I did want to play this one piece because, this is the this is the the reason I'm here, and this is the what started it all for me. And it it was a simple four minute video clip, you know that that happened to um, show up on the internet one day, and it was for a television show that I had done in New York called Ukulele Disco. And I think I told this story the last time, but since then I've made some changes to the song, so I thought I, I I'd play it again, but. This is uh, George Harrison's While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and probably my favorite song to play on the ukulele. And I, 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 I can't play this enough. This is just so much fun. But it's, it's amazing, you know, talking about how to like express yourself through the instrument. You know, it's not just about, it's not just about the notes that you're playing or the chords that you're playing, you know, but it's, it's everything, you know, it's the, like, just like the, all the sounds that you can create, you know?
you very much. Thank you. Woo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was awesome. Just want to know you. That was just a, such a famous version. It's how I was introduced to your music. Um, yeah. And just want to know if you guys, uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit about George Harrison. I know that he was an ambassador of the ukulele. Uh, he's George was famous for riding around in a car full of them mm -hmm. and passing them out and wanting to get literally get together and play with everyone. Uh, he went. If you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know George Harrison uh, was was one of my heroes. I mean he. He just adored this instrument. I mean, he had he had a hundred times more ukuleles than, than than I have, you know. And uh, but he um, the the cool thing though, I you know, I never got to meet him. I, I wish I did. Um, I met uh, you know his his uh, his wife Olivia Harrison a few times. You know, she actually came to a couple of my shows, and uh, that was that was uh, pretty amazing being able to to speak with her and and talk with her. And she just she she kept telling me like, oh, I wish. You know, George was still alive today, you know, because he just loved this instrument so much and he he really believed that this instrument had so much potential, you know, to uh, reach beyond, you know, uh, um, you know, I mean, to me, and I, I think, and I, you know, I can't say exactly, but I think George Harrison probably felt the same way, you know, I think that the ukulele is very special because it's different from other instruments because people aren't afraid of this instrument. They're not intimidated by it. You're, you know, and because a lot of people don't even think of it as a real instrument. They think it's a toy, right? <laughs> but, you know, and, and I embrace that. I love that because I think every instrument should, sh people should feel like that about every instrument. The piano, oh, the piano, I can do, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, or the violin or whatever it is because because if, if you're afraid of an instrument, then you're, you're never going to want to pick it up. You'll be too intimidated, you know, or in your mind, you think it's too hard. But with the ukulele, I mean, my grandmother just started playing the ukulele, you know, and now she's like jamming with her girlfriends, you know, and they're like, say, you are my sunshine, my only son. You know, they're singing songs like that. But, but like I said earlier, you know, I believe that music is not just the universal language, but it's the language of the universe. And there's something amazing that happens when you have the ability to speak that language you know when you can pick up an instrument and just do this and you know that I can do this it just makes you feel so good you know it's it, I tell you it's like an entire yoga session in one strum I mean you you can play one chord over and over and over and there's just something about that it just like brings you back to center you know it zeroes you out and, uh, and George Harrison loved that about this instrument. He loved turning people onto it and loved showing people how easy it is to play because you get that instant gratification. The moment you pick it up, you know, you can just take one finger and just put it right there and be like, wow. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. If I had to do that on a trumpet, it would take me like two months before I could even get a decent sound, right? Or a violin, like it takes you two months before you can even hold the bow without cramping, right? So it's that instant gratification. And I think that pe when people pick it up for the first time and they play it, they're like, wow, I can do this. I can make music. And to me, that's the joy that music should bring. I mean, joy, that joy, everyone should feel that joy when they're playing the piano for the first time, when they're playing the violin for the first time, when they're playing the saxophone for the first time, when they're playing the guitar for the first time. If everyone could feel that joy, you know, I think there would be a lot more people playing instruments. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I had a question for you, Jake. Oh, I, yeah. I was at the screening of the, the documentary. Congratulations oh, on that. Oh, thank you very Pretty much. Amazing. Yeah. Um, one thing that really came through on the documentary is how much of a family affair your music is. And so I wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit more about that and um, maybe let us know if that um, Shimabukuro family concert at that screening is going to be available <laughs> later. <laughs> oh, well, the, the, uh, the documentary that, that Cliff's talking about is I, I just recently did a... Um, it's uh, my first full-length documentary with PBS, and we've been shooting it for a little over two years now. And we just, I mean, we just uh, wrapped it up 
last week Wednesday, and uh, and it's going to be um, premiering at some of the the film festivals, and and it's also going to broadcast on on PBS National TV sometime early next year. So I'm very excited about this because, uh, well, in in the in the it was pretty amazing just for me to kind of sit and I, I don't like to see myself on on television or you know or anything, but but just being able to to sit there and and see the last you know like 30 years of, of my life just kind of go by and and it really took me back to why I fell in love with this instrument how I got into it you know um, I started playing at the age of four and I got into it because my my mom played you know she played and you know the, the first thing she taught me was my C chord and I would just do this all day you know and I, I I just I loved it. I I did that, you know, I I did that every day. I'd come home from school, pick up my ukulele and just and just play. And um and my my mom loved it. You know, my family they they love music and and I think um I also have a younger brother who plays too, you know. And when we were kids, that's what we do together, you know. We'd always play the ukulele together. My brother was really good at sports and I mean, he was very well-rounded. Like for me, I the only thing I could do was play the ukulele. Like to this day, I can't dribble and do a layup you know I mean I'm like horrible but but there was something about music that I I could just I could just you know just sit down for hours at a time and just play and, and discover new chords and new sounds so you know that that really kept our family you know together my dad played a little bit of guitar and uh, but I mean you know they, they weren't professional or anything. they weren't professional musicians or anything but there was always music playing in the in the house so I think um in the documentary, it kind of talks about like, you know, my parents, you know, they divorced and all that. And, you know, so music kind of became my, um, you know, because my mom was my first teacher and she would spend a lot of time, you know, uh, when I was a kid teaching me. So I think once my parents got the divorce and my mom had to work all the time, you know, my, my brother and I were five years apart. So I would always stay home and I would always have to watch him. You know, I always, I always felt like he was more like my son than my brother. And, uh, and so I think playing the ukulele for me was, in my mind, you know, now looking back at everything, was kind of like that was me trying to make up for those lost times of, you know, spending with my mom or my family, you know, kind of took me back. So, so the, so, you know, so that's why I guess that's where my passion, I guess, comes from, you know, for this instrument. And, uh, and it really is, um, even though I'm away from home a lot of times, having the ukulele with me and being able to play and share all of these things um, I think always I always feel like you know I'm I'm right back with them so yeah thank you uh, I was just wondering if you had any plans or expectations on teaching your baby the ukulele and oh. if so at what age you're planning on introducing <laughs> yeah it? well I, I I have no expectations right now I mean I just <laughs> You know, I, I want him to, to do whatever whatever he wants to do. But I definitely want him to have music. And it's funny because, um, you know, on, on, my, on my new album, uh, the, the song that I wrote for him, you know, is called Gentle Mandolin. And it's the third song on the, on the, on the album. And it's funny because recently my, my wife discovered, like, while I was on tour, my wife discovered that when he's crying, if she puts the CD on, he immediately stops and she says it's amazing so so she said she puts the cd on and as soon as she puts it on you know the, the first song starts and he just like she said he just like kind of stops and he just kind of listens and he just he's just he becomes super mellow then the second song comes on you know and it's actually a cover of adele's rolling in the deep and he listens through that and then she said the third song comes on, which is the song I wrote for him. As soon as that song starts, he starts, wah, like starts crying. I mean, she, and she said, it's, it's like, it's unbelievable. Every single time, he just, she said, he just doesn't like that song. So, so I don't know. So, you know, I, but anyways, so I probably won't be teaching him that song, but I'll, yeah, but I definitely want to get him into music. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you were talking uh, a little earlier about just kind of growing up with the ukulele and uh, playing it for so long, but it's an instrument I've heard my entire life, and it's I've never heard it played uh, the way you do until you came along. So, what happened in your life when you were playing? What? W when did it start 
transpiring, you started learning new things and you started bringing things out of, out of the instrument that other people didn't see? Um, I, I think, you know, for me, I, like I started out playing all traditional Hawaiian music and, um, but then I, I, I think there, there came a time, like I think when I was uh, uh, just in, you know, in my early teenage years, um, when I saw my first uh, Van Halen concert, you know, because, and, and it wasn't so much that I wanted to play all those fancy guitar riffs or anything like that, but it was more about the energy. When I see rock bands play, I admire their energy. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily I want to play that kind of music or I want to play that song or anything, but I want to play with that kind of energy. And so whether I'm playing a, a, a Hawaiian tune or a jazz standard or like a classical piece or a, a, a pop tune or even if, it, if I'm covering a rock song, you know, I want to play with that energy all the time. And it's not always the physical kind of energy or the kind of, uh, the, the kind of energy that, that, that you can see visually, like just the running and jumping on stage, you know, jumping around and all that. I mean, that's great too. I like that, you know, like when I play... You know, I like to I like to kind of move, you know, with with the music, but it's it's also the other kind of energy, the 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 the, the energy that comes from within, you know, that 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 focus, that that mental focus. Like I'm always talking about, like when I'm um, like when I'm strumming, like when I would do workshops, and I would I would talk with kids and performers about, you know, when you're playing your instrument, it doesn't matter what instrument you're playing, you know, like when, when I'm playing the ukulele and, and I'm going to, and I'm going to play a, a chord, you know, it's not just the mechanics. It's not just about my, my, uh, my finger, my hand, you know, my fingers holding down the right strings and my hand just doing this. It's not, it's not about that, but there's so much that happens before and after, you know, the, the stroke. So there, there's a lot of, lot of preparation and I always, um, I always kind of compare it to like a pitcher. You know, when you watch a really good baseball pitcher, you know, the wind up, I mean, everything, the, the follow through, the, the focus, you know, the, the, the visualizing of how the, the ball is going to curve or, you know, or drop. All of that is so important. Like even when you're playing the ukulele, you know, like that, that's, that's what I'm thinking. I'm, you know, be, before I even, I even hit the strings, like, you know, um, you can't really tell, but like my my toes like curl up, you know, in my shoes, and you know, and I, I can it's it's I, I can feel like all that energy, you know, in in my in my ankles and the balls of my feet, you know, to my knees, to my hips. I mean, everything that comes down up up my back through my shoulders, and and when I make contact with the string, you know, it's just it's all that energy you know, directed this way. And it's not just the physical energy, but it's, it's all my, my mental focus, my thoughts, everything is going in that direction, going with the, with the music, you know, playing with that kind of conviction, my, my spirit, everything that I have, that I have control of, I try to bring that into every stroke, into every strum. And it's not just the hard hitting stuff, you know, it's, it's the soft stuff too. It's like when you play, you know, you know, I wanna just bring that, bring every note out, you know, and it's, and it's still that follow through, that, that same conviction, that same energy that I would if I were playing like a, a rock tune, you know, in a classical piece or a ballad, it's a different kind of energy, you know, but it's still that same intensity with that same conviction, you know, that you want to like put into every little note, every little movement, you know, everything that you do needs to be somehow connected to the movement, I mean, to the music. You know, whether it's like the, whether it's a, just a simple tapping of the foot or tapping of the toes, or if it's a little like twitch in the, in, in the face, you know, like you watch guitar players sometimes and they, they do these uncontrollable like facial, experience. you know, they're just like, you know, and, and it's, it's because, it's because they're, all of that, all of that movement, everything that's happening is somehow connected with a sound or an idea or a concept that they're trying to convey, you know, emotionally. And I, I don't remember what the question was anymore, <laughs> but um, I hope I answered it. Yeah, yeah. You, you did answer it. Oh, okay, okay. Right here. 
Thank you so much for, for playing for us today. Oh, no, um, I have a question about if there's anything particular about your instrument uh, that you'd like to talk about. Um, how did you end up choosing this particular ukulele to play today? Oh, yeah. Well, this is, um, this is an instrument, uh, an ukulele made by a family called the Kamaka family, and they're made right in Hawaii. And they were the first family to start manufacturing ukuleles in the world. They're, they're, uh, I think they're going, on, they're going on four generations of ukulele makers right now, and it's, it's just a family business. And, um, and they were the first Hawaiians to learn how to build these instruments from the Portuguese immigrants that came over to the islands, you know, to work in the plantation fields. So, you know, so they were the ones who really started to build the first ukuleles. And, uh, and it's quite extraordinary, you know, because they've, they've been building ukuleles for almost 100 years now. And, and uh, when I was a kid, you know, um, in Hawaii, everybody knows Kamaka ukulele. It's like, it's kind of like the, I mean, when I, was, when I was growing up, my dream was to have this ukulele. This, it's, this is a, they call this a tenor size instrument. It's a tenor four string Kamaka. And it was my dream to have this instrument because in, in my eyes, it was like the Excalibur of instruments. And I, um, and you know, but they're they're very expensive. So you know, at you know, when I was a kid, there was no way I could afford something like this. And you know, so now that I, I get to play this instrument every day, um, I I just feel so so honored, you know, because um, you know, there's just so much history and so much experience and knowledge that goes into every single one of their instruments. So to actually be able to to play and, and to, to use one, you know, to travel with and to create music with, to write music with, um, you know, I just feel like, like all of that, that, that history, you know, comes with everything that I, that I do. So, yeah, but that's what it is. It's a kamaka. Yeah. Yes. Um, hi. It's hi. always such an inspiration to see you perform. And um, last two years ago, when I last saw you, I was so inspired that I went and I bought an ukulele because yeah. I used to play the sort of Venezuelan four-string quattro. It's pretty oh, much the yes, same yes. thing, right? So I took it and I went to the guitar store. I just went right from where you were. I went right to the guitar store, <laughs> brought this wow. little four-string thing, took it home, and there I am with my little three chords, you know, chinka 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 chinka. Anyway, my, my 13-year-old, my then 13-year-old wanders up like, hey, mom, what's that? I never saw it again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Really? She goes off to school every day with a fiberglass ukulele strung, slung across her back. And uh, nice. she just, you know, she's just, so I just wanted to let you know that, you know, you kind of, you know, had that kind of impact. Oh, just no. that one thank day. you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. that's beautiful. You know, uh, one of the coolest things for me is seeing, you know, like when I, when I tour now and do shows, we see a lot of kids, you know, young kids um, come to the show now and they, and they, and they don't look like ukulele players. They, they come with the ukulele players, but they have their fingernails all painted black. They have like spiky hair, piercings, you know? And they just think like the ukulele is the coolest thing. They'll come up and they'll be like, oh yeah, I used to play like, you know, heavy metal guitar. And then I saw, you know, you play like, while well, my guitar jelly weeps on YouTube. And oh, and I threw my guitar away and I bought an ukulele. And this is all I play now. And it's just the most incredible thing, right? Because because 10 years ago, or even, I don't know, like, yeah, maybe not even 10 years ago, it was always the opposite. You know, people would start on the ukulele, and then after that, once they, once they can play it pretty good, then they want to put it away and move on to a guitar, you know, because their goal is to play the guitar, and they use the ukulele as a stepping stool to get to the guitar. But now it's, it's really cool that people that have been playing the guitar want to put their guitars away and pick up the ukulele, you know, so it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Oh. Uh, thanks for the amazing performance. So I just have a question that have you ever thought about like giving up becoming the musicians like back then when you were frustrated and how you get through that? Oh, um, no, I mean, it's, it's, I've never, um, I, I never, the thought never crossed my mind that, that I would ever want to give, give up playing, you know. Um, but to be honest, when I was a kid, or I mean, even up until 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I had no idea that I was going to be a touring musician or, uh, or even, a, you know, or I could do this all the time. I mean, 
I knew that I would always play this instrument for the rest of my life because it's it's my passion, you know. But I thought it would just be like coffee shops or you know. I mean, when I when I was a uh, just out of high school, I used to play at a lot of weddings and graduation parties and birthday parties and family functions, but never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I'd be doing what I'm doing today, you know? So, um, so it, it, it never crossed my mind that I'm gonna ever give this up, you know? But as, as, uh, as things started to evolve and, and a career started to shape up for me, you know, through, um, through the internet and all that, and now I'm touring, I mean, you know, I mean, now we like now we're uh, on, on this just this in this next two months, you know, we're touring through 40 cities and, you know, we got a whole tour bus now and like, you know, a seven a, a seven man crew. I mean, with a sound and lighting guy. And I never imagined any of that. You know, I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, when I was growing up, I, I thought I was going to be like a school teacher. You know, I thought I was going to go into education because um, I love working with kids. And then I thought the ukulele is the perfect way to connect with kids. You know, so I thought in my classes and the lessons, I could always use this, so I would always have it. But it's been it's been real challenging. You know, I mean, there have been times like when I first started touring. You know, um, you know, it was it was uh, yeah. I mean, there there were a lot of challenges. You know, but you kind of get through them. You know, you work through them. I mean. Like I said, when I first started performing, I couldn't look at everyone and play. I mean, I was so nervous. I would just, you know, I'd be so afraid to talk and, uh, and, and you know, and, and it's hard, you know, but, but you just, you love it. You love it so much and you want to, you always want to um, figure out, oh, how, how can I, how can I improve on this? How can I make this better? Because I realized that as, you know, I can practice all I want in my room, you know, just by myself. But it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't give me that same satisfaction, you know, because to me, again, music is, is all about communicating. It's about making a connection with people. And once I started learning how to connect with people through this instrument, oh my gosh, it was like just a rush. You know, like now when I perform, you know, at a nice, at a, at a venue and it's, and there are moments where like, you know, I'd, I'd be, I'd be playing and you get to a real sensitive part and like, you know, you play that one chord and you can just almost feel the entire audience just breathing with you and just <coughs> taking it all in and just waiting for that last note to, to, to fade away. And then even after you can, you can't hear it anymore. It's just silence, 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 silence. And then everyone like, you know, kind of starts clapping or like, you know, and, and it's those moments that, you know, it's such a rush because um, you just feel like everyone is experiencing the same thing. And it's, I guess the only way I can think about it is like when you, uh, like for surfers, you know, when they catch that, that perfect wave and they're just on that wave and just, Nothing else matters, you know, you're just on that wave or like, you know, when I'm on stage and I'm playing, it's like nothing else matters. I mean, I'm just, just having, really literally having the time of my life. And, um, and so for me, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, there, there are challenges, but, but a lot of it is just, you know, it's just pressure that I put on myself you know, just because I want to, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist in some ways and, you know, and I want to keep learning and keep discovering new things, you know. So sometimes you go through these periods where you're just at a plateau and you're like, when's that next idea, you know, going to come or when's that, you know, that next concept, you know, going to come. But, but yeah, you, you find ways to, you know, when the, but then when, when, you, when you find it, then it's like, oh my gosh, yes, that's, that's amazing. And, you know, and it just, it, it carries you, that inspiration, that, that, uh, that excitement carries you through the next one, you know? And so it's, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I, I guess I can't get enough of hearing about Why My Guitar Gently Weeps, which was always yes. one of my favorite songs. Oh. And it's the reason I know who you are, because a close <laughs> friend of mine said, oh, you got to listen to this guy. You, you know, here he is on YouTube. His name's Jake something. And you got to <laughs> listen to it. And, and the, you, your version of it just blew me away. It was absolutely Thank you. gorgeous. And especially a song that I care so much about, to hear someone else do it. Is, mm. It was so beautiful. It moved me to tears. And I actually made it my ringtone. 
and oh, like no a week way. before you came to Google the first time, yeah. and then I saw you the first time and had a chance to talk to you and ask you if you'd ever met George Harrison, and I forgot to tell you that I'd actually just made it my ringtone even before you were going to come to Google, so you got copyright issues notwithstanding. I just no, no, no. That to you. But I just wanted to ask you, uh, what made you put that song up on YouTube? Was that also one of your favorite songs, or was it just by chance? Yeah. Well, you know, to be honest, like till this day, I don't know who put it up on YouTube. <laughs> you no, know, I because um, you know, and I and I said this last time too. You know, I, I mean, you know, you know, and I'm not not you know, just I'm just being like totally honest and sincere, like you know, but because this was like seven years ago, so I I I didn't know what YouTube was back then, you know, I mean, I'm not very internet savvy, but I think YouTube just kind of started around that time too, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't that famous yet, right? I mean, not too many people knew about it, but I mean, I was, I was doing some email, but you know, I wasn't really active on, on the, on the websites and internet and all that, you know, but, um, but when, so what happened was I, I just did this thing for a local TV show. And that's what they did the interview for. They, they videotaped me doing that, and then it aired on, on TV, you know? And it was just a small little local network, and, and, and that was it. And then I went back home to Hawaii, and about two months later, I had a lot of friends that were, that were here on the, in Hawaii. We, we call this the mainland, you know? So we're, I had a lot of friends on the mainland going to school, and, and they started calling me or sending me emails, and they were like, hey, you know, like there's this, uh, this video clip that's kind of, you know, that, that's going around our campus of you playing. I was like, what are you talking about? So they, they sent me the link. And at this time, you know, and at that time, it was still like, you know, that concept of emailing a video or a video link to somebody was kind of like, what? You're going to email me a video? What are you talking about? You know, but it was because uh, it was just kind of starting out. So, um, so he, they, they emailed me this, this link and I clicked on it and it took me right to that the YouTube video and, I, and then there it was and I just was like I, I don't understand what <laughs> what am I looking at you know and then and then it and already it had it had o uh, almost two million views already and I I couldn't believe it right and I was just and there was and there wasn't a term for it back then we, we didn't even there wasn't even such thing as a viral video yet we, we didn't even know what to call it it was just happening and and it was uh, shortly after that, you know, the numbers just started growing and growing and growing. And there were multiple videos. So there was one that, that didn't even have my name. It just said, while my guitar gently weeps. And it was that same video. Then there was one that was like, crazy Asian ukulele player. You know? And it, so I, I saw about, you know, there were about eight or nine different videos. And all of them had like over a million views, right? And then, but none of them had my name yet, right? <laughs> so it wasn't until I think like a few months after that that finally there was a video that had my name on it. It was, you know, Jake Shirukro, you know, whatever. And then, um, and then that, that video just started growing and growing and growing. And, uh, and so, and all the other ones just slowly disappeared. I think now there's, I think there's, there's still a couple, couple other ones out there, but the main one right now um, that, that was left that, I know when, when it first just had my name on it, it was, you know, like something like 30,000, you know, views. And that was like maybe four years ago or something, you know. But then that one, even from four years ago, that one grew to over 10 million now. And it's amazing how it's still just growing. And so people are still discovering this video for the first time. And, it's, uh, and so it's been quite extraordinary. And, and you know, that, that video changed my life. I mean, I wish I knew who the first person was that put it on because, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, what I, that's what I tell people. I think George Harrison up there had something to do with it, you know. But yeah, it, it really, it, it changed my life. And, uh, and from that, I started getting calls from other artists to come and open for them. Oh, I'll take care, you know, to tour with them and, and open for them or record with them. And it's been totally extraordinary. So thank you. Yeah. So, so now, Jake, hey, Jake. Um, yeah. So now you know why it took so long for them to attach your name to the video, because it took them that long to learn how to spell your last name. Yeah, I know. <laughs> No, it's so true, so true. All right, so I have a quick question. Uh -huh. It's a 
give you a heads up, a little bit of a setup question, but uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the work that you did with Alan Parsons. Uh, so obviously he's a very well-known you know, Grammy-nominated producer and engineer, but you have, yourself as a musician for a long time have worked with a lot of producers and engineers. What made him different? What did he do differently, like radically different than you know, the masses of, of audio engineers that are out there? Okay. Um, well, the, the, one of the coolest things about Alan, I mean, from, from day one, just like being in a recording studio with him was the, the first thing I noticed was the way he mic'd my ukulele, the way he recorded my ukulele. Every recording engineer I've ever worked with, you know, always, I mean, they, you know, th there was always at least one microphone in front of my instrument. You know, a lot of times if they record in stereo, they would have one here and then one here, right? Because that's how they, you know, they record guitars in stereo like that. I've done mid-side miking, you know, where you have where you have one one mic in the middle, like kind of a stereo spread, and then and then you have one across the top. I've you know I've been in situations where they would surround me with microphones, you know, put microphones all over me, or put a microphone, you know, put two microphones right here, and then put two in the back of the room or behind me. But this was the first time that someone told me to okay, yes, just stand right here. He got one microphone, he put it here under the neck of my ukulele, and he put another one right here above my right shoulder. And I was like, are you sure <laughs> this is going to work? <laughs> and uh, so he was like, yeah, yeah, just, just play, and I'll make some adjustments. So I started playing, and he just kind of tweaked it a little bit, just moved, but kept it right there. And then he kind of tweaked this one like that. And then and he was like, all right, yeah, just play something. So I, I, just, I just started, you know, I launched into a song, and I, I played it. And, uh, and then he said, okay, come in and tell me if you like the sound. So I walked into the control room. He played it back and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was just, it was the sound of my instrument, the way that I always hear it, the way that I hear it, you know, like, cause I've always, I've, I've always just accepted that every time I, I record, you know, my studio sound, what I can get on a record, is just different from like my live sound or like what I hear when I'm practicing. But it was the first time I walked into that room and he played it back and it, it just, I, I, I kind of, I was stunned because I was like, oh my gosh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm playing my instrument right now, you know? I mean, that's how it felt. And so I asked him about that. I, I said, I said, Alan, what made you decide to record the ukulele this way? And he said, well, he wanted to, he wanted to record a, he wanted to record it in stereo. So he wanted at least two microphones. And uh, so we could get a right and a left channel. But what he said was, when he records guitars that way, you usually put one here and then one up here, right? Because the guitar is longer. So you can get a, a wider stereo spread that way. But he, but he thought that because the ukulele is shorter, if you were to put one mic here at the body and one mic here at the neck, because the ukulele is so tiny, the mics are gonna pick up pretty much the same sound. So you're not gonna get that much of a stereo difference. The right and the left are gonna sound very similar. So he thought he could get a wider stereo spread if he put one mic down here to pick up closer to the first string and one mic up here, which would pick up closer to the fourth string. And that way he can keep the mics further apart, yet they'd be the same distance to the instrument, you know? And I mean, that was just, it sounds simple, but it was just the most brilliant thing, you know, that I had ever heard. And I was like, wow. So when you listen to the album, you're thinking this great stereo spread that you're hearing. I mean, it's like you're in the middle of the instrument, but it's not so much right and left, but it's more up and down, you know? So it's like he took that up and down sound and just flipped it over so you get your right and your left. And, you know, that, so that, that for me was like, wow, that was amazing. And then, and then, you know, other things like, because Alan comes from that old school way of recording, he wanted to do everything live. I mean, so we have a 29 piece orchestra on, on, on a few of these tracks and everything was recorded live. There are absolutely no overdubs. So we went, we went into this huge studio. We had the 29 piece orchestra there. And then I was in the same room with the orchestra. The only thing that divided me from the orchestra was a glass door. 
And we all watched the same conductor up there, and, and we all played. And, uh, and there's something amazing that happens when you, when you do that, when you play live, because all the instruments, I, I mean, all the musicians are listening to each other and playing off of each other. You know, so there are a lot of spontaneous things that just happen that wouldn't have happened if we just played all our parts separately, because we would have just been reading the music and just played you know, our parts. But because we were playing it together, you know, it's that whole synergy effect you know we're all creating something together we're all in the room together making this you know and, and it was just it was really beautiful you know there's a um that song missing three that i played for you you know it's it's a it's a three string song i was so proud of it because you know i was like oh and you only play it with three strings and i sent that that was the first demo that i had sent to alan and he listened to it and i didn't tell him the story yet i just sent him the song and he listened to it. he's like oh gosh that's beautiful and he told me I can just hear an entire string section playing with you on that, right? And so it was, it was ironic because, you know, it's a song that, that you know, I, I wrote it with just three strings, but now there's a 29-piece orchestra, so there's over, <laughs> over 100 strings on the song now. But still, you know, I mean, but he was very, very, um, he, was, he was very careful about making sure that the ukulele was here and everything else played around it. You know, he didn't want anything to bury the ukulele, and yeah, and it, it was just amazing working with him. He mixed the entire record in two days. He would just get up there and you know all the faders, and he just and in like 20 seconds, he'd have like a perfect mix of like a 29-piece orchestra with me and the and it was just like the and he would just sit back and listen. He'd be like. Well, maybe the horns need to come down a little bit right here, you know. And then he'll turn around and be like, oh, what, what do you think? I was just like, oh, sounds great. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah, it was really inspiring working with him. So, yeah. oh. I think this is our last question, it, too. It is. And, and so I, I was wondering, in, in each of your albums, you know, your style changes, your style evolves. So what, what about Grand, Grand Ukulele are you um, most proud of in the evolution of your style, and where do you see it going in the future? Oh, there were, um, you know, there, there were a, a lot of things on, on this record, like just really subtle things that, that um, you know, like I was talking about, like always just looking for that one thing, you know, to make it different. Um, there, there were songs on this album where I utilized techniques that I never used before, you know. For example, uh, there's this one song called Music Box where, where, you know, where I do this thing where I keep my thumb alternating between the third and fourth string. And then I play the whole entire song or entire melody on the first string. You know, and but there's this one section in the song where I play that melody um, harmonically. So while I'm keeping this going, I play this melody. And uh, it, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to play it for you here. Cause, like, that, that section right there for me was like, I had never done anything like that before. So I thought that was cool. There was another, in, another place, and, and, you know, and you'll, you'll never notice it unless I talk about it, but in, uh, I, I did a version of... Um, of uh, of uh, Fields of Gold. And there's this one section in there where I take the melody, you know, it's a. Da, 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 da. So there's this one section where I play that harmonically as well again. But what I do is I, I, I utilize this technique where instead of, just, instead of just playing the harmonics by itself, I would fret a string to almost like to mimic like a bass, a bass note. So I have a, so like, uh, so this over the, over the F chord, what I'm doing is I'm holding the F root, but as I play that F root, I'm also gonna use my other fingers to play the harmonics of the other strings together like this. So I can get this kind of harmony, which is something you, you don't, you, you can't, you don't hear. Like ukulele players will, will know like, how do you get that F major seven sound, you know, with harmonics? But so when I play that part, it's like. See, so for me, that was another like, 
you know, I'd never done anything. You know, this kind of stuff. You know, that, that kind of sound, it's very, um, you know, Jaco Pastorius, one of my favorite guitar players, I mean, favorite bass players, you know, would do things like that where he would kind of roll, you know, he would kind of roll the, the bass around and he would, he would fret these amazing harmonics and just get these incredible, you know, I don't know if you can hear that. So, hear that? So that's the flat seven there. You never hear that. You, you would never usually hear that on the ukulele, but you're able to. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So those, those kinds of things, you know, I mean, that, that, that's the kind of stuff that really keeps me going. And most people won't, won't, won't hear it or won't notice it. But, you know, but for me, it's like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, I just, that, that makes the entire arrangement for me, you know, or the, or, that, or the entire song. So, yeah, so, I mean, it was, it was I had a great time working on this, this record. You know, it, he, I really feel like, you know, I, uh, Alan really pushed me in the studio, and, and, and so it was great, because that's what you want from a producer who knows how to push, but not over push, you know, where you get discouraged, but, you know, you just, and, and it was such a great experience. He brought in just some amazing musicians, like Kip Winger, you know, from the band Winger. He did some of the orchestral arrangements. We had uh, Simon Phillips, one of my favorite drummers, you know, from Toto. He, uh, he played on the record. Um, Randy Tico is a phenomenal uh, bass player. Um, yeah, it was, just, it was just really inspiring, you know, so for me, because Alan, you know, I mean, he's worked with everyone from the Beatles to, you know, um, I mean, I mean, he's just, even with his Alan Parsons project and all that, you know, Pink Floyd, you know, he's able to, his vision is so grand. It's so, he has so much experience. And so his, for me, a lot of times my vision only comes with what I can, you know, it, 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 it only, I, I only see what I can do with the ukulele, but I don't think beyond, you know, beyond that, you know, whereas Alan, Alan Parsons comes from that school where, you know, he's, you know, he, he's worked with so many orchestras. He's worked with so many arrangers. He's worked with so many rhythm sections and, and he's recorded so many different kinds of instruments and he knows all about microphones and preamps and he knows how to get this kind of sound. Or if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to you know, express something, he knows the best way to, to capture that so that it translates, you know, when you listen to it on a record. If I'm going for that real sensitive, you know, touch, like he knows how to, how to pick it up with a mic and, you know, using the right microphone with the right preamp, you know, and placing it in the, in the, in the, in the right spot so that we can get that sound. Or even if I'm playing with the orchestra, how to, how to, um, how to EQ the, the strings or how to EQ the, the horns or the woodwind so that, so that it doesn't, it doesn't, the, the frequencies don't, don't overpower the ukulele and the ukulele can still be over because a lot of times it's not just a volume issue but it's a panning issue like where you place it in the mix in the stereo mix you know and then also how you eq it so that you eq it just in a way so that it 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 um you know which is i it is i i i i don't really understand all this kind of stuff but <laughs> but you know but it just that's that you know i have very limited understanding i mean it's a whole science and and it's amazing. His ears are just incredible. Like we'd be mixing, we'd be mixing the song. You know, we'd we'd like be recording something, and he'd be in the room, and and then the the, the you know we'll be on the listening on the playback, right? It'd be like just listening, and like oh yeah, okay, that sounded all right, and we're listening, and then and the phone would ring, and Alan would be like oh, okay, wait, I got I got to get the phone, and then so he'll he'll kind of step out, and he'll be on the phone, you know, and, and he like outside of the studio, all of a sudden he'll come right back in. What, what was that? What was that? Let, go, go, go back. Go back like, you know, go back like 20 seconds. You know, it's amazing. Like he just hears everything. And, and it was just uh, extraordinary to, to work with him and to see someone, you know, because when he's, when he's in the studio, like he's just like a little kid. Like he just, he loves it. He's so passionate about recording. And, you know, so to work with someone like that um, was really inspiring, you know, because for me, this is what I, you know, I'm passionate about this. And then to work with him, who's passionate about doing all the other stuff is, uh, I think it was a great collaboration. And, you know, it was one of the, uh, the greatest uh, recording experiences of, of my life. So.
Well, great. Thanks so much for coming here, and we look forward to picking up the conversation when you come back here. Yeah, at all. Next time. Thanks, Nick. This is great. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. 